It's days like this that make me wonder about sweet home Chicago, <laughs> let me tell you. How many of you ever been to a tailgating party? Shame on you if you've never been. You need to go, okay? Tailgating parties are awesome. They're pretty amazing, aren't they? Incredible. When, when I first moved here, actually, and this is why I had to show that video real quick, is in the trib, uh, just had this, it's called Step Up to the Plate. There's a whole article about this group that puts on this amazing tailgate party at the White Sox game. Who even goes to the White Sox games? <laughs> any any Southsiders out there? Yeah, I thought so. How, any Northsiders? <laughs> all right, all right. I, I'd say it's about even. At least the, at least the Southsiders have something to cheer for. Um, Anyway, oh, I know, you're cheering for next year. I know, I know, I get it. So here's the deal, though. This, this tailgate party, I read this article in the trip. It's like, oh, my gosh, hosting up to 300 people, this group of tailgaters sets the party pace in Sox parking lot E. The secret, here it is, teamwork. Teamwork, all right? What began as just a few friends and relatives has snowballed into parties of literally hundreds of people hanging out with enough food and drink to rival that which is found in the park. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about what this says about some of the intricate details that go into this. Planning the menu, weeks in advance, placing the meat order, picking up supplies, and on game day, these fans who put on the parking lot party, if you will, the tailgate party, they actually arrive before most of the players even arrive, okay? Which might be part of the problem with our teams, perhaps. But here's the deal. And this, this, uh, this guy, Joe Kahn, who's the self-proclaimed commissioner of tailgating, he says he calls the stadium parking lot the, the, the last great American neighborhood. The last great, it's the new community social. Isn't that kind of amazing? That people are so desperately, these folks get it. These folks that are watching the Cubs and Sox game, they get it. It's not, I mean, because they're watching bad baseball, seriously, okay? But in all honesty, we, they understand the simple concept that life is better when it's done together. I mean, together is great, isn't it? How many of you are going to go to some Super Bowl parties today? Most all of you in this room are going to gather with some friends, with some family, and watch the Super Bowl in some way, shape, or form, okay? Uh, and so together is great. And we're starting a brand new series today called Better Together because some things, actually most things in life, really are better together. Let's play a little game just to get us going in this kind of mindset. I'm going to say a word. You tell me what goes with it, okay? Peanut butter and really anything if, if you're in my book, okay? Cookies. How many of you smell some cookies on your way in? Just a few of you, okay? There, but we have some chocolate chip cookies actually brewing back here that are going to be available after. Cookies and milk, milk right, okay? Batman and? Sonny and? Simon and? Okay, some of you showing your age now. Starsky and? Tom and? Tom Brady and? No, not Giselle. Who cares about her? Tom Brady and deflated footballs. Are you kidding me? Come on. <laughs> Chocolate and anything. One guy said bacon. I said amen, brother. <laughs> anything with chocolate, okay? So what is it that drives people to go to such great lengths just for a tailgate party, just to kind of do life together? It's that just insatiable desire to find a place to belong a place to be accepted, a place to fit in, a place to feel safe. And it doesn't matter if it's a team, a block party, a job, a knitting club, a book club, a particular cause, whatever it might be, we all want our safe place to fit in and belong. Dr. Edward Hollowell says this in his book, Connect. He says, we are a nation of doers. We hurry from place to place, filling our lives with all kinds of activities, sometimes overscheduling our kids and ourselves. Any amens out there? All right. But what really sustains us emotionally, psychologically, and physically is a sense of connectedness. A feeling that we are a part of something that matters. Something larger than ourselves that gives life meaning. Friends, come on. Don't you believe that that desire, and I believe it's a God-given desire, to find a place to belong should be filled by something more meaningful than a tailgate party. 
And that is exactly what I would propose to you today that God has given us in this incredible organism called the church. I'll just tell you a little bias right up front. Yes, I'm a pastor. Yes, we're at church. I believe the local church, the local church, I believe, is the hope of the world. I really do. I believe that there is nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. There is no team. There is no club. There is no organization that can compete with the local church when the local church is working right. It truly is was designed and is designed to be the hub of our relationships. It is not simply a place for you to show up at, listen to some you know, good tunes, which we've got some good tunes, hear some decent preaching, which occasionally when Will preaches we get some decent preaching. It's not a place just to come and hang out in the lobby and enjoy a cookie on your way out. It is a place to belong. A place to belong. Whatever else you want to say about Christianity, at its very core, it is about relationships. The Bible says that you and I were made for relationships. In Genesis, the first thing that God says, and this is before the fall, that was not good, it was not good for man to be alone. I believe that every single person on the face of planet Earth is desperately longing for two things. We have two gaping voids that I believe God intentionally created in our lives. One is a God-shaped void, which can only be filled with a personal and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The second, however, is a human-shaped void that can only be filled by deep and meaningful and authentic relationships. Every one of us has a desperate longing to be in a right relationship with God, but just as equally, we have a longing to be in real relationships with other people. We truly do want to learn to do life better together. And so we're going to talk about that for a couple of weeks, okay? How can we be better together? Does that sound pretty good to you? It's what we're going to talk about for a couple of weeks. Now, and this, whether you're a believer or not, I'm telling you, this is huge stuff. Every person desires to belong. So let me just point out, first of all, better together is God's design. I believe that better together is God's design. Did you know that over 50 different times in the New Testament, at least 56 different times, there are one another's or each other's that we have direct, just total, like principles, commands that we are to do. Devoted to one another, love one another, serve one another, admonish one another, encourage one another, you know, teach one another, accept one another, honor each other, bear with one another, forgive each other, submit to one another. That's one we all love. Be devoted to one another. All these commands are what the church, what our relationships are supposed to be about. Friends, I'm telling you, there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. But when we come together as one in Christ, I'm telling you, there is no tailgate party that will even come close to comparison. And there's absolutely nothing, I can just tell you right now, that I would rather give my life to. There's no other place I'd rather invest my time and effort and energy because I believe this is the way God designed it. And I would challenge you, and I, I, I don't think all of you are called to be pastors, not at all, but you're called to be a part of a community. You are called to belong, to do life together. And if we're going to do life together, we might as well do it together well. Amen? Learn how to do life together well. Now, let me just say, God loves unity. When we come together as one in unity, God loves that. It's a huge theme all throughout the New Testament. It's so important that the New Testament gives more attention to the unity of the church than he does even heaven or hell. God desires for us to have this unity. It is the very heart of authentic relationship. You destroy unity and it literally rips out the heart of Christ's body. Without unity, there is no fellowship. Without fellowship, there is no church. Just at the highest level, the ultimate example of perfect unity, authentic community, is the Trinity. The perfect example is the Trinity. God has perfect relationship with himself. Our, and our Heavenly Father, like every other parent, enjoys watching his children get along with each other. Jesus, in his final moments before being arrested, he prayed passionately that we would be unified and get along. And the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us in the body of believers to do that, for it to become a reality. But part of the responsibility of every single believer is to develop 
and to protect the unity here at the Branch Community Church. Let's walk through a passage of scripture together that makes this crystal clear. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. In Ephesians chapter 4. Now, we're jumping right to the middle of Ephesians. Let me just tell you, the first three chapters of Ephesians kind of really take you through. This is who you are as believers in Christ. This is who you are. You're holy. You're blameless. You're accepted. You're loved. You're, you're all these things. And then he gets to Ephesians 4 and he goes, and by the way, this is how some of this is going to play out. This is how you should act and treat each other. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, because you are believers, you are to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. And friends, I don't believe you're here by mistake. I don't believe our two churches merged together by mistake. I believe we are called by God, especially on a blizzard day like this. Are you kidding me? God got you out of bed. You must either have some serious penance you need to do or something. No, I just believe you are called by God, okay? So verse 2, be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourselves together with peace. We are all one body. We have the same spirit. We've all been called to the same glorious future. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one God and Father who is over us all and in us all and living through us all. We're going to look at verse 16 together in a moment as well. But God says here, let's go back to verse 1. He says, lead a life worthy of your calling. And that calling includes being his child, being his friend, being his servant, and being a part of his team, the body of believers. God has given us a family to do life with. And in order to do that, Paul gives us some real practical marching orders. He says, hey, if you're going to lead a life worthy of your calling, here's what that means. It means you're going to learn to be like Jesus. Well, what was Jesus like? Look at verse 1. Be humble and gentle. I mean, Jesus is a perfect example. Humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Let me let you know a little secret. Just like in any family, your church family, other believers, I know this may like surprise me, people sitting around you. Look around the room real quick. Some of these people sitting around in this room, they're going to disappoint you. They're going to, let me take it a step further. I'm going to go bold here. They're going to tick you off. You're going to get sideways with each other. You're going to be like, well, I don't like how he said that. Well, she looked at me funny. She smells today. She, I mean, the closer you get to each other, friend, the more the reality is going to be, there's going to be awkwardness in our relationship. You know, it's easy to play nice. It's easy to have a little honeymoon and, oh, you know, 150-year-old church and five-year-old church coming together. It's easy to do that, you know, for a little season. But as we start to really get to know each other, find out all of our warts and all of our stuff, you know, and friends, listen, even if you don't plan on being a part of this church, this applies for you the rest of your life in relationships. So don't just kind of go, well, I'm not going to be here anyway, you know. You need to listen to this stuff. This is good, practical stuff. We are a family. And in a family, you get up close to each other and you irritate each other, don't you? You get on your, each other's nerves, sometimes on your very last nerve. Some of you had a huge fight on the way to church this morning, didn't you? I mean, some of you had a fight over whether or not you were going to come to church. Are you kidding me, Mom? We got to go today? It's a blizzard. Are you kidding me? You know, what is up with that? We are going to get sideways with people in our family. We're going to get goofy with each other. But listen to this description of family. I love this. Family is a group. It's a group of people which possesses and implements an irrational commitment to one another, to the well-being of its members. An irrational commitment to the well-being of its members. How many of you here are parents today? All right. If you are a parent, tell me you don't understand irrational commitment. Because your knuckleheaded son or your goofy daughter, they have done stuff and you have gone over the top. You've sacrificed life and limb. You've done anything you could possibly do for their well-being, haven't you? Some of you who aren't parents, you go, well, my mom, I'd do anything for her. Absolutely you would. There is this, this irrational commitment to our family members. Even the ones who are way, sometimes especially the ones who are way out there, right? 
Even if they've abused that time after time after time, and you even feel like you're enabling and you're enabling and you probably are, we still have this irrational commitment. Friends, that's what should happen in the body of believers, an irrational commitment to one another. That's exactly what Paul is getting at here when he says you need to make allowance for each other's faults. Because believe it or not, not just those people have faults, you have faults. And in the church, think about it, there's conflict, there's hypocrisy, there's neglect, there's pettiness, there's legalism. There's, I mean, the list could just go on and on and on of all the things that are going to compete you know, and try to keep us from getting along and working together. And I just got to, got to help us understand, we should not be shocked or surprised when we find out that people in the church are just as messed up as we are. Or maybe you might even think even messed, more messed up than you are. And people are going to hurt you, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a classic on this, on community, this book called Life Together. In it, he says this, I love this. He says, disillusionment with our local church is a good thing. Now, when did you expect your pastor to say that? <laughs> disillusionment with our local church is a good thing. Why? Because it destroys our false expectations of perfection. Amen, amen, and amen. The sooner we give up the illusion that a church must be perfect in order to love it, the sooner we can stop pretending and start admitting we're all imperfect and we desperately need grace. Friends, that is the beginning, he says, of real, authentic community. How many of you saw our son out here when you pulled up today? Our new son. It's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, beautiful. Branch community, church, great colors, all that kind of thing. Woohoo! You know what we probably should have had out there? Instead of our new name, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> only as is, only under construction, only in process, only like, you know, slightly irregular. Whatever tag you want to put, that's what we're about. We are not a museum for saints. We don't have it all together. Friends, we are going to, if we start to authentically do life together, we are going to understand we're messed up. We have junk. But can we make allowance? Can we have an irrational commitment to the well-being of each other regardless of that? Because that's what Paul is talking about here. Making allowance. You know what that literally means? Putting up with, tolerating each other. That's what we do in our family. The closer you get, the more you realize people's icky stuff. And you see those weaknesses and those warts and that junk and they start to irritate you. The people that you get closest to, I guarantee you they're going to irritate you the most. But we choose. We choose to do life together. And we can choose to be irrationally committed to one another, to the well-being of its members. That's the thing that a family decides is that we want that closeness even at the risk of all that danger and all that pain and all that hurt we want to put up with each other another translation says to bear with one another to make allowance for paul goes on to say we should focus on what we share in common not our differences look at verse three always keep yourselves work really really hard at is what he's saying at being united in the Holy Spirit. Bind yourselves together with peace. In other words, make every effort to keep peace. Now that doesn't mean you're always going to be at peace with everybody, but you are responsible to keep short accounts. You're responsible when someone hurts your feelings or says something that, 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 that just doesn't sit well with you. You're responsible to go to them and go, hey, that didn't feel right. Kind of dinged me a little bit. I want to make peace with that. You're responsible to do everything you can to make peace with people we can't always be at peace but we've got to do our part and as believers look at verse 4 we are one body we have the same spirit we've been called to the same glorious future we're going to be together a long time people we might as well start getting along now there's one lord one faith one baptism there's one god and father who is over us all and in us all and living through us all one body one purpose one father one spirit one hope, one faith, one baptism, one love, one salvation, the same life, the same future. These things are far more important than any differences that might come up. These are the things that should make for harmony and unity and the growth of authentic community together. And here's the thing I want you to see. God wants unity, not uniformity. 
It's one of the things I love about our church. We're very, very diverse, all kinds of backgrounds. But God wants us to be unified, but not uniformity. He doesn't want us to be a bunch of little clones of each other that all read the same translation, that all do the, and believe the exact same thing about every little thing, you know. God wants us to be unified over what matters most, over majoring on the majors and not majoring on the minors. God wants, hey, maturity is realizing that we are indeed better together and that we must give our all for the team that sometimes that means not worrying about my little petty you know worry about this or that or whatever it might be look at verse 16 under his direction in other words under his complete control the whole body is fitted together perfectly as each part that's you that's me that's each one of us as each part does its own special work It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body, and this is the goal, the whole body is healthy. Why healthy? We don't need to focus on growth. We need to focus on, as a church, being healthy. Because if we keep relationships healthy, if we stay right, guess what? Healthy things grow. So the body's going to be healthy and growing and full of love. I love that. If you and I will do the hard work of maintaining unity working together, staying focused on what matters most, and what matters most, loving God, loving people, right? Loving God, loving people. Then the whole body can be healthy, can start growing, and can just be saturated with love. That's what it's about. That's what we have to stay focused. That's our job, is to stay unified. And that's unity of purpose, not unity of personality. You can have unity without uniformity. It's being united around our mission, our vision, and our values. I'm going to tell you this, friend. In every single ministry team, elders, trustees, all the way down you know, to our nursery, to anything we do, every decision we make, every discussion we're going to have is going to be about how can we reach one more person who's far from God and lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus. That's what's going to drive us. That's what's going to keep us unified. We can't start focusing on, I don't know about these renovations over here. I, I'm just not sure I'm crazy about that. Well, I just, you know, I, I wish we had this. I, I don't like having that. I mean, it's got to be, are we focused on the end game of what matters most is leading one more person who's far from God into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what will unify us, staying focused on what matters most. Several years ago, I took my family to that popular documentary. This was when the kids were a lot younger, March of the Penguins. Remember that show? Did anybody go see that movie or was I the only one? Okay, March of the Penguins. It's an entire movie on the mating and parenting patterns of penguins. After birthing an egg, the mother would pass the egg very gently, you know, with her feet to the father. And then she would go on this 70-mile journey to go get food and water and then come back. So all this time, 70 mile trek, you know, comes back and then dad would pass little junior, you know, back on his feet across to her feet and then he would go on a 70 mile journey and come back. I mean, it's incredible watching this and their commitment, their irrational commitment to what mattered most. What mattered most to them? Little junior, right? They knew little junior's what matters. Friends, little junior to God is loving him and loving people. That's what matters most. And that's what we've got to stay focused on. Having an irrational commitment to one another, to being the church that's going to stay focused on that. I mean, it was amazing watching these penguins work together, doing everything humanly, or I guess I should say penguinly possible. Try saying that 12 times, okay? to take care of little junior they realize that that's what matters most and that's what the branch is going to be about clinging to jesus and connecting with people just totally all out committed to the greatest cause ever the redemption of mankind how crazy is it that we get to be a part of that that the god of the universe chose you to be on his team and invite you to participate with him in the redemption of mankind of people actually realizing that the God of the universe wants a personal relationship with them, that he's passionately pursuing that. That's what we get to be a part of. 
Friends, if you're not convinced yet about this better together idea, let me show you what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17 and what's been come to be known as his high priestly prayer in verse 20. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Guess who that includes? The Branch Community Church, you, me, all of us. Here's what he prays for us. I pray that they may all be one. Just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. What's this unity about? So that the world may believe. I've given them the glory that you gave me so that we may be one, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you in me. May they experience such perfect... This is Jesus praying for us even right now. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. I see a pretty common theme there. It's called unity. It's called one. It's called the power of one. Jesus prayed that we would become one. One heart, one mind. That we'd be in the world, but not of it. That we'd work together in harmony, just as closely as he and the Father do. And I believe we need to realize the power of unity, the power of one. Because when we do that, the world will stand up and take notice. I'm telling you, friends, what will give this church, what will give us the credibility, the greatest credibility, is our love for one another. If we truly become better together, better together will give us credibility look at john chapter 13 verse 34 jesus said this he says now i'm giving you a new commandment love each other jesus that's not new what, what, what are you talking about that, heard that a hundred times what what the new here's the level of love this is supreme love this is graduate level loving just as i have loved you so you must love each other that's what all these one another's are about just like he loved us, we've got to now have an irrational commitment to love one another. And your love for one another, what's it going to do? It's going to prove to the world. They're going to stand up and take notice. It's going to prove to the world that you are my disciples. It does not say they'll know you're Christians by the really cool place that you meet with curtains and the happening band and, you know, the preacher who's got that funny accent. They're not going to know we're Christians by that. They know the world won't. The world is tired of hearing homophobic. The world is tired of hearing legalistic. The world is looking for, will you love me? And they go, I don't think they'll love me because they can't even love each other. I moved here 15 years ago from a county in North Carolina that there literally were in 100,000 people in this county, in the whole county, okay, there was almost 200 Southern Baptist churches in that little county. You know why? Because I don't like that translation. Split, start another church. Well, they looked at me funny. Split, another church. Split another. Now, I'm not saying that some of those couldn't have been God ordained, but I'm telling you, I think it broke the heart of God to watch some of these churches just struggling for resources and everything else because there was just so many churches because they couldn't get along because they focused on the minors rather than what mattered most of reaching people and using all of our resources and doing everything we possibly can to reach people and grow people. To reach people and grow people. To give people a safe place besides the bar, besides the PTO, besides the bowling alley, to find somewhere to belong. That's what the church needs to be. That's what Jesus is telling us here so clearly. They'll know we are Christians by our love. That they might be brought to complete unity so that the world might know. It's no wonder the world is confused when they see the way that we treat each other, the lack of love we have for one another. It's no wonder the world doesn't care what we have to say because they see the way that we live. They can't even hear our words because they keep seeing the way we treat each other. So we've got to be committed to growing strong and healthy relationships. And it's not easy. It's not going to happen overnight, you know. But you know what's cool? We've already seen some real glimpses of it, you know. We, we did this thing called Sports and Bible Camp 
where we just kind of, you know, two churches, 150 years old, five years old, we just kind of put our hands in together and say, hey, let's love on some kids and let's have some sports and let's tell them some Bible stories. Let's just have a great time and love on some kids. It was awesome. We, we, we had family fun night last Saturday night. 80 people, almost half of them probably just from the community going, hey, what's going on over there? And they just walked in and went, wow, these people aren't as weird as I thought they were. Well, they're kind of weird, but I mean, I could maybe check these people out if it's not a blizzard outside, you know. Um, but I mean, where else are you going to get those kind of relationships? Where else are you going to get that? The church is what God designed. The, lo- the older I get and the more I've been around, the, and the more I understand the deepest needs of human beings, I'm telling you, the more impressed and amazed I am by this brilliant concept that God came up with called the church. God made the church to meet our deepest needs, our need to know Him, and our need to do life together well with people. Stuart Briscoe said this about what could and should happen in a church. He says, if our world is to see a real picture of what God is doing, it needs to see considerably more than individual people finding a cure for individual ills. I am so tired of hearing people going, I don't need the church, man. Church is all messed up. I got this personal thing with God going on. No, that's just garbage. They do need a group of people to love on them and do life. You don't just fly solo. Read the scriptures. God makes it crystal clear. There's no Lone Ranger Christians. We are to do life deeply with each other. That's why there's such an emphasis placed on this. And here's what he goes on to say. People should look and see a unique society of totally diverse people so united in Christ that they're working in many ways through their God-given gifts to build up individuals and produce, this is what we should be, an alternative society that's becoming increasingly mature and more attractive. Tailgate party should never compete with the church. But again, what are we going to say to the world until we start throwing better parties? But again, it excites me that I'm already seeing the possibility of this. I'm seeing glimpses of it. And I just want to encourage you, man, you better fasten your seatbelt and hold on tight because it's going to get bumpy occasionally. Because the closer we get, I mean, think how crazy it is. All those churches in Carolina split. We took a 150-year-old church and a 5-year-old church and said, okay, let's get married. Well, I don't like him. She, I mean, just think of all the ways the enemy could fight against that. If we don't do this simple, hard work of absolutely staying committed, irrationally committed to the well-being of its members and to the purpose of what matters most. Friends, I believe with God's help, we're already seeing it, but with God's help, better together can become a reality. Why do I believe that? Because I'm just silly enough to believe that, okay? I think God's big enough to do that. But not only that, the reason I think God's big enough to do that is because I can look back in Scripture and see times where he's already done that. Look at Acts chapter 2. I love this passage. God gives a very clear picture of what better together actually could and should look like. Acts chapter 2, this is when this deal actually happened, where people just got irrationally committed to one another. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They joined together with the other believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing in the Lord's Supper and in prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together constantly, shared everything they had. They sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, look what happened. The Lord added to their group, added to their number, those who were being saved. Friends, that's awesome. There's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. Ten times in the first five chapters of Acts, which is a story of the church and its beginnings and all, it just goes on and on about unity. They were of one accord. They were unified. They were all together. They were of one heart, one spirit. They had all things common. They shared everything. Wherever there was a need, they met it. They had an irrational commitment to one another. And friends, I believe that when we have the unity that the Acts 2 church had, we will also see the power that the Acts 2 church had. I believe that if we will work hard to do our part to keep peace, 
to make allowance for each other's faults, to learn how to do life together well. I'm telling you, Jesus prayed for this. Jesus challenged us with this in John chapter 13. And this is a thing that the whole world will stand up and take notice. Every single one of us, even penguins for crying out loud, instinctively know that we are better together. So I want to challenge every single one of you in this room to never, ever be the one who would cause disunity. Don't be the one who would listen to gossip. Don't be the one who would spread God. Don't be, because the enemy is going to whisper in every one of our ears and try to get us off track. You don't be the one. I don't know if you got one of these walking in, but you'll definitely get one walking out, okay? Please don't leave without this. This is called the Branch Community Church Unity Covenant, okay? And we're going to have you sign this in blood. I'm kidding, kidding. Whoa, I'm done. No Kool-Aid for me, baby. Um, what I want you to do, honestly, is I want you to take this. And I want you to read through this. I want you to prayerfully think about it. And if you're just even, and I know some of you are like, man, dude's kind of going off today. You know, I, I just, I want you to realize, hey, we're a safe place for anybody to come on. But boy, we can't be that if we just, you know, carry on. And I'm not, this is not reacting against anything. This is trying to be proactive to say, this is what God teaches. So let's do this. Let's learn to do life together well. And so I'm going to just ask you to prayerfully kind of read through, look up these verses, think about, and, and you know, and over the course of the next couple of weeks as we talk about accepting one another, and this is going to be some great just relational stuff that all of us can use, even if you're not a believer, stuff that would make great impact in your life and your family, okay? But what I want to encourage you to do is to think about this, pray about it, and if you honestly, I mean, put this in your Bible, put it on your refrigerator, I mean, don't take this lightly. If you honestly feel like, boy, I am absolutely ready to go all in with these folks, I'm ready to put my hand in, then I just want to challenge you to sign it. It's just between you and God. I don't need to see it. I'm not going to sign it, you know, for, you know, along with you. I just want to ask you to sign it and say, God, I'm drawing a line in the sand. These are my peeps, and we're going to do some life together. And it's going to be hard. They're going to get on my nerves. But we're going to have an irrational commitment to one another because life is better together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that we're all across the board on this stuff. Some of us couldn't agree more wholeheartedly. Some of us are going, oh, yeah, yeah, something's going on. I got it. Some of us are going, dude, could, could we just, just give me something a little more practical? I don't know how to get much more practical than this. But God, I pray that every single one of us, you would meet us right where we are. And Lord, you would challenge us and you would encourage us and you would help us to see that the local bar, the PTO, the knitting club, the book clubs, the tailgate parties, all those things that people are so desperately running to trying to find this community are what you want to help us build here at the branch community church so god we invite you to do whatever you need to do to make that a reality i invite you to do whatever you need to do in my heart and the elders and the trustees and father just every one of us god may there never be personal agenda may there never be just just personalities that are just trying to take oh may god may there just simply be one heart one mind one purpose loving you loving each other leading people into growing relationship with jesus christ that's what we desperately want to focus we know that's what you've called us to and we want to be a part of that so father i pray that you'd help us to do the hard work on our own to do our part. Father, we love you so much. Pray you give us a great afternoon and a safe ride home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here today.